So let's get started. So welcome to Resilience Up in Turbulent Times. We have an hour fully packed with hopefully some value adding content for you. And I'll do an introduction in a moment uh, of Joni Petty, who's going to be hosting today's session. And just wanted to take this opportunity to inform you of the Master Leader Program and a little bit about it. So we are launching the Master Leader Program this year. It's a nine month open edu online immersion program. And it's the link between inner development and affecting real change, creating conscious leaders who are ready to build their inner skills, learn new practices, and align with higher business principles. And the purpose behind this is to be of greater service to those that they work with, whether it's in their communities, in the world at large, in organizations, and becoming unstoppable forces of positive change. And really here, what we're looking at is people who are committed to personal and positive social change. We're looking to develop and attract a new generation of individuals and leaders who want to bring consciousness into their work and into their lives and who are now committed to operating in the workplace with a focus on multiple bottom lines and making business a force for good. Our program is designed fully online, thanks to COVID. It's high touch, it's customized, interactive, and it engages learners over a period of nine months. We have a faculty that is world-class, spread across the globe, as well as engaging speakers from business and wisdom teachers. We believe that it's really transformational in design, encompassing values-driven business, neuroscience, psychology, mindfulness, compassion, and social innovation. And it is part of forming a conscious community. It's part of forming a movement. So we've got a program overview. You can find out more about it by visiting our website, various different screen streams, learning pods, assessments that are built in. We've got various different events happening over the nine months of synchronous and asynchronous learning. And we believe that some of the bonus material that we're offering, the additional conscious workshops are going to be of a great value add to individuals as well. And today's session really is a snippet. It's a taster of Joni's work as our SME facilitator of module eight, themed around peak performance and resilience. And in today's session, Joni's going to be literally focusing in on resilience and how to become a more resilient person and leader in today's turbulent times. To find out more about the program, please visit our website and you can learn a lot there. Subscribe to our newsletter, which is issued weekly. Follow us on LinkedIn and become part of forming this community of our first cohort of the Master Leader Program. So thanks everyone. And I'd really like to welcome Joni onto this call today. Joni has so generously, in the spirit of what we're building here, offered her time, her valuable services. And Joni's been behind the scenes working for over two and a half years on developing an assessment specifically focused on resilience. And this launched globally last year in October. So she's going to be walking us through a very rich, interesting journey through the lens of resilience and what she has to offer on today's program. So without further ado, we hand over to Joni and thank you again. And we welcome participants. This is an engaging session today. Please put your questions in the chat box. Natalie Vessels will be monitoring the chat and we'll be opening it up at various different stages today to take your questions that Joni will happily answer for you. Thank you so much, Anita. 
Yep, it's actually lovely to see friends in the room. So Eric, uh, really lovely to see you and Willem, lovely to see you and, and Ron as well. So there are six of you and three of us. So this will be very chatty and intimate and that's the way I love it. I always say wisdom is in the room. So let's cross fertilize ideas and I'll share abundantly with you um, what we've been doing worldwide and just a snippet really of what practically you could take away in terms of dimensions of resilience. It's a big topic and uh, it's something that uh, really you need to put into action to see and benefit from. Yep, let's discuss what we can each do differently uh, today, 365 days after the first day of lockdown, well, as from midnight tonight. The world is so vastly different and it's really quite exciting. I mean, I've been writing a note this morning on a hybrid conference that we are putting together for the PSASA in April, the first hybrid conference in person and virtual and 12 countries involved. And it's really, it's exciting times, but it's pretty daunting for many. We've seen a mental well-being at its, at its really low edge, um, especially in South Africa. I've been doing quite a lot of work with the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, lots of panel work, work for the IOD on this. So it's it's uh, there's a lot I'm sure we can all do. We all practitioners, it seems like here on, on the call in different ways. So what can we do to ensure that we are practicing resilience and that we are sharing that uh, with our clients and uh, our significant others as well, people we live with. Okay, so very quickly, I just like to have a little quick check in and I'll check the chat box. So, well, Natalie and Anita, on a scale of 0 to 10, be honest, be honest. Where are you? Naught, flat, tired, no agility, maybe four kind of there, you know, treading water, or seven, eight, nine, or 10, where you va, va, boom, and you're kind of on top of the world. Where are you? In the chat box, three, two, one, let's go. I'm monitoring that as well. Natalie's on an eight. Well, of course, I knew you would say 10. <laughs> I'm glad that we have people like Erna, three-ish, Pat, six, yes. Ron, minus 25. <laughs> okay, I love that. <laughs> Ron, you and I will stay uh, after class and do a bit of one-on-one -on -one work if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, when I do this, actually, for many teams, I'm fortunate to, to work with six seconds. Actually, that's their emotional intelligence wheel behind me then 174 countries and they backed me for the resilience assessment so we've launched in 174 countries when we do this work on resilience most people are very much like owner they're in the three mark and it doesn't matter whether it's turkey saudi arabia or wherever we're working it's uh, people are rarely battling so um run i haven't seen that humor for a while minus 25. okay so this is going to be all about your own personal spinning top that is the metaphor we are using. So it requires a bit of igniting. It requires you to trigger something. And it's not necessarily all four domains of resilience. It could be one, it could be two. It's just something that gets that momentum going. So when we talk about resilience, we really talk about that momentum of energy and agility, energy and agility, and how that keeps us going. And how, as a spinning top does, when it's got enough vuma in it, it's got enough energy going around, it can come across a little coin on the floor and it will have that agility to move around it. So there's small obstacles and to keep going. It might wobble as we all do, but uh, again, we can reignite it. So that is going to be the theme of what I'm going to chat through are these four dimensions of resilience and really your own spinning top effect. The spinning top has got quite a lot of psychology behind it. We have called this the resilience cycle. And I have to say it was really thrilling when I heard that Dr. Caroline Leaf was launching her Clean Up Your Mental Mess book. I don't know if any of you have got the book. I was really excited two days ago. I ordered it when it was launched in America on the 2nd of March. And my copy arrived. Yay. It's already kind of got wet in the bath the last two nights. And she speaks a lot about uh, her neurocycle. So as a, a neuroscientist, it was really exciting. As, as Anita said, we started working on this six seconds in, in America and Momentum 4 in the UK and myself two and a half years ago. And we said, we really need to enable people to gain more self-awareness. So that is the spinning top effect that leads into self-belief. And what are your limiting beliefs? 
and to start to unravel that with a bit of momentum, it goes into what's your personal impact and maybe there's interpersonal impact. And then of course, we know that we can rewire our brain and our habits. So what patterns are you choosing to change? And that takes you to another revolution of self-awareness. So, um, you know, what are you going to start to work on next? Because it is a journey as I'm sure everybody in, on this call agrees. So that inner dimension of agility and energy is really what are the driving forces behind your spinning top. And I often wake up in the morning and my morning meditation, you know, I think, gee, but am I going to have enough energy to get through what I, I want to get through today? And uh, often I'm my worst uh, enemy in terms of what I want to get through in the day, and uh, I should have a little more self-compassion, but it's a, it's a kind of conscious tightrope you walk in terms of this is what I want to do, uh, have I got the energy, have I got the agility to work around those obstacles, and what if that doesn't go as well as I expected, or what, what if that, that group doesn't pitch up the way we suggested it should happen, so it's all of the what ifs, the shoulds, the et cetera's. And of course, now dealing in the way we're dealing with uh, managing teams online and leading online and managing workshops online. I was online this morning with the Competition Commission, which is an interesting client. They're phenomenal people. My goodness, 223 people at the Competition Commission. Half of them are lawyers, half of them are economists, and they will not put their cameras on uh, in any of their exco and man come meetings. So to get any resilience change in that organization is taking, taking uh, quite a lot of effort. Uh, I'm working with my colleague in Siki Makiza and her and I are laughing a lot about actually it's, it's really a drive to do some of the work we're all doing online um, and how challenging and sometimes exciting it is. So the resilience cycle, uh, five of you will win a coaching session with me, and we'll talk about this at the end. And what I will be taking you through is empowering you with the resilience cycle, your own spinning top for well-being, and uh, really where do you want to start, and how does that translate into eventually shifting patterns and deeply held uh, limiting be beliefs. So the ripple effect is something we're all aware of, but I just think very often we forget about uh, that emotions drive people and people drive performance. And really your own resilience will have an effect on your family members. I now have uh, both daughters finishing, uh, who have finished at Stellenbosch University and they're both home. And I'm finding it interesting with three of us working from home in different places and how we have an impact on each other. And I said to Anita and Natalie the other day, I laughed myself silly, it's sort of lunchtime, we've only got like four or five minutes each, there's nothing planned, you go to the kitchen, you know, what can you get, and elbowing each other out for the leftover dinner the night before, and those macro moments that are such fun with uh, having a 21-year-old and a 23-year-old in the home. But it, it really is very real and apparent to me is uh, my energy, my dynamism, my optimism as a force multiplier, how that has an effect on them and vice versa, actually. So it's, uh, it's so interesting the way our, our way of being and the impact on our significant others who live under our roof. And then, of course, we know we have that impact on our clients and colleagues and uh, certainly in our communities as well. I belong to a, a big running community, and um, it's very interesting for me to see what's happening in different industry sectors and different life worlds. It's also inter interesting um, at the moment running that Professional Speakers Association of Southern Africa. So that community and the changes and the difficulties people are going through. So... Yeah, it starts with us. It's that initial ripple. So what are we doing here today? You're giving up an hour of your time to see what you can do differently about your resilience. Before we get going, if I say to you, please, Willem or Ron or one of you, describe resilience according to these three photographs. Anyone want to take yourself off mute, given that there's six of you, we've got uh, time to do that. Describe resilience according to these three photographs. Can I pick a name? Eric, what about you? I haven't seen you for donkey's years, literally. Your description of resilience, say, uh, using the three prompts of the three squares. Um, yeah, I would go, you know, two or three, right? Two or three. I think it's all of them. Uh, i tell you why. Two is the proverbial bounce back. Three is the proverbial bounce forward. But actually, what we're all doing here today, and we teach most what we need to learn, is how can we be prepared in order to be resilient. 
So what are the preparation things that we need? And I suppose that's where I'm going to focus is like, what can you leave with by one o'clock in your sticky paws that uh, will help you be resilient and help you no matter what the adversity, what the challenge, not only bounce back, but bounce forward. So two or three is the right answer, Eric, but uh, today we're going to really look at one. The dimensions of resilience that we researched and have built an assessment around is these four dimensions. So there's not one that's more important than the other. They're obviously all interconnected and it doesn't matter where you start, as I said a few moments ago. So I'm gonna take you through all four, but really one sliver of each of those four. If you're interested in playing more with this, clearly you need to come on the Master Leader Program. There's lots you can do with our resilience assessment if you wanted to. So I'm suggesting that you grab a pen and write down a tiny habit. I'm steeped in Professor BJ Fogg's work from Stanford. Let's not overwhelm ourselves. Let's do one thing that's tiny and minuscule and can be integrated into our day and enable us to be prepared to be resilient. So what's in our sticky paws? And uh, what will you take away as a result of doing this is we challenging you to pen us an email is that correct? No, type us an email. You pen on your paper. Type us an email as to saying what tiny habits, perhaps per dimension or maybe even just one dimension. And I always say to my 21-year-old and 23-year-old, nothing for nothing. So uh, you will get uh, free gifts as a result of doing that. And clearly, I will only tell you those at the end. I said to Anita and to Natalie that uh, very often when I do this with clients, uh, we get these lovely emails back. That was great. And we so enjoyed this. And this was kind of a highlight for me. But if you don't say specifically what uh, behavior you're going to shift, whether it's a, a thinking pattern, an emotive uh, way of building your emotional literacy, or an action. Um, I always say, you know, we overcomplicate humans. We think, we feel, and we act. Those are the three things we do as humans. So which of those three are you going to bear in mind and build awareness around so that you can start that resilience cycle? Okay, in terms of our own performance, uh, it looks like quite a few of you run your own business, is that uh, we really need to look at our daily pressures. We need to look at the fact that uh, if we're not operating at our best in our performance and having some pressure, energy will leak and having too much pressure, we know that energy leaks. So if energy and agility really is that driving force behind your spinning top, then how much have you got? I look at this uh, graph and I think to myself, and I use this a lot, and this is actually on a poster that we can send you if you choose to email us. Because I sit back and I say, okay, Joni, what are you doing in terms of your non-negotiables for your mind or your body, your emotions or your purpose? So I'm going to go on to speaking about sleep under the body dimension. And it was World Sleep Day this time last Friday. And uh, I had a lot of uh, exciting interviews, TV, radio and print because I am the sleep evangelist. So I do a lot of keynote talking on sleep. And I walk that talk. So I am more of an introvert than my husband. He is more of an extrovert. He loves to socialize. He loves having people around for dinners. And I have to say to him, darling, during the week, could we have our 579 agreement? That's my non-negotiable for family members or friends coming for dinner. And he goes, Joni, I can't stand that non-negotiable of yours. Because what does that mean? It means that people can arrive between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. But they have to, have to be in their car by 9 p.m. So it's a non-negotiable. And he said, it's, Gavin, my husband says, Joni, it's so jolly rude to invite people to say that. And I go, not if you say it up front. And you go, hi, Jane and Tom, would you like to come for dinner? It's a 579 dinner. Because my non-negotiable is I am lights out by 9.30. I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I go running with my mates at quarter past five every morning. And I need that sleep and I want that sleep. So that is my body non-negotiable from a sleep aspect of body. There's much more to body than just sleep, I know. But uh, this is quite a nice way of just self-evaluating. What are your non-negotiables? Have you got those? I've got a non-negotiable around emotions. So with uh, my two 20-something-year-old daughters, and um, some of you know that I, I was widowed 
when they were seven and nine and, and I'm happily remarried now, but I, that means I've got two stepchildren and with two stepchildren comes another dimension of discussion around emotions. And I now have two grandchildren, which is delightful. So between four children, two grandchildren and a daughter-in-law, there are always family issues which means that there are a lot of emotional discussions and they have different age groups, et cetera. My non-negotiable, and in fact, it's now Gavin and I's non-negotiable, is when we walk into our bedroom, that's our sanctity. That's our breathe out from the day. There'll be no emotional discussions around the four children, all the roof leaking. There'll be nothing around tension and issues and problems to solve. Obviously, that's got a mind aspect to it as well. So what are the kind of habits and rituals you're putting into your life so that you stay in that high performance zone? And some are clearly negotiable and some are clearly non-negotiable. So let's get into sleep now. Let's talk about uh, my favorite topic at the moment, uh, corona somnia. It is a term we're using medically because all of us, whether you've had COVID or not, are suffering corona somnia. It's an abbreviated term. It should be corona insomnia. So it's insomnia that we are suffering as a result of the pandemic. There's a piece of research. I don't need to read it to you. And I must say, every person who comes through a workshop or comes for coaching on uh, sleep issues is saying, Joni, I am really battling. Maybe battling to fall asleep, maybe battling to stay asleep. I'm awake at 2, 3 in the morning. Um, and it's affecting my performance. So we need to have a look at the two main aspects of sleep. And this, uh, because we've got limited time together, it's safety belts on, I'm going really fast. At the end of this body section, uh, Natalie will be reading for questions. But how many hours of sleep? It's a bell curve. So minimum seven hours, maximum nine. If you're sleeping more than nine, it could be a comorbidity or a depression issue that needs to be addressed. Seven is what people battle to get, and that is my non-negotiable. I also am very mindful around what's happening in my body. So if I've got that scratchy throat or a bit of a foggy head, then my note to self is, okay, tonight I probably need more than seven. I think earlier this week, I even posted it on Facebook. I slept uh, a good solid eight hours, 10 minutes, which is very unlike me. I don't really normally need that, but I think my body was just fighting something off. And I also use a fantastic little app, which uh, I use the free version. It's called Sleep Cycle. I thought I'd just show it to you here, but actually I'm not going to try and get into the green light of the, of the camera. And it actually looks like the cell C orange, and it's a, a little alarm clock. Use that free version. I monitor my sleep every night in terms of uh, the cycles and the, and the REM sleep. And it tells me, it told me earlier this week that I was talking in my sleep. Gavin is away in Durban, so he, he uh, I had no one to verify if I was talking, but I probably was. So I woke up feeling hell of a refreshed and fantastic. So the bell curve is what you need to take into account. First of all, if you're not getting seven hours, that's you've got to work up to that. And then what do you need according to your current state of health? Uh, slightly more than seven if, you, if you're fighting something. The second aspect of sleep is quality sleep. Now it's a no brainer that our screen time has gone up worldwide. And for me, I used to only wear blue blockers uh, at night. I try not be on my mobile for 60 minutes before I go to bed. So I actually have a daily digital detox. No TV, no mobile, no laptop for 60 minutes. It's, it's a non-negotiable for me. So I do read uh, my book books at night, lovely hardcover or softcover paper books, which is just so much yummier than a, a Kindle or anything else. But this blue light issue is an issue. So I've started to wear these blue light blocking glasses. This is the brand is truly blue. And I do shout from the rooftops about them because I was using another brand for the last three years, actually. And I found these far easier to read, uh, wear because they are um, not colored. The last pair were red that I used to wear, which was quite difficult at night to read my book. And then secondly, I just really like the guys that are bringing Truly Blue into the country. They import all the components and then they assemble them here. They're down to earth Pretoria guys. They say it like it is. And I've started to collaborate with them. So there is a voucher code. If you go to my website, it will take you straight through to their website. 
youth journey is about to code if you want to order a pair. This is not a selling gig, but I have to say that they've got a funky website. You can try on various glasses. They fit fantastically. And I'm also, my grandchildren who are coming up from Cape Town for Easter now, well, the three-year-olds certainly is getting a pair of kids' glasses as well. You won't get the pink because you won't like that. It's not his color. He'll get the blue pair, but um, he's watching TV before he goes to bed. And when I babysat him in Cape Town, I've noticed that uh, he'll wake up in the middle of the night and he's not getting enough melatonin into his brain. And we as adults should be worried about the same thing. So why do we need mel melatonin? Because that is what flushes out the beta amyloid in your brain. So daily while you're awake for those 16 hours or so, your brain builds up beta amyloid, which is the plaque between the neurons. You can grow about 700 neurons a day, but if you are getting plaque between those neurons, much like plaque between your teeth, the connections, the dendrites, the synapses aren't working and you will get Alzheimer's or dementia. In fact, it's linked to heart disease, it's linked to lifestyle diseases like uh, diabetes too. So the brain as a conductor of the ecosystem of health is something we need to take into account. I am a frustrated uh, neuroscientist. I've said to my girls, now that they've finished studying, I'm kind of thinking Stanford, Stanford could be a good call and neuroscience could be a good call. I'm just fascinated with neuroplasticity and what this beautiful organ between our ears can do and actually how we can live longer and better if we know how to replenish uh, our brains and avoid that toxicity. So what else about body? It's really imperative that you are moving your body. Sitting for two hours behind your screen, your good cholesterol goes down by 40%. So what are you doing to move during the day? Let's ignore uh, running, cycling, paddling first thing in the morning, but are you setting your mobile to go off every hour or every 90 minutes to get up and do 10 squats or to skip? I've got a rebounder on my veranda of my office. I go and bounce for two minutes. The research from NASA on bouncing for two minutes, it's equivalent to a six minute run or a 10 minute swim or a 22 minute walk. So I absolutely keep that going during the day. And of course, how does that link into sleep? So many people, including the people under, who live under my roof in my home go, oh, I had a bad night's sleep. I can't come and run with you tomorrow, mom, or go for a walk, etc. So you skip exercise, the cortisol is excessive, you eat bad food and it's a vicious circle. So however you choose to exercise, if you're a non-exercising type of person, I would really say, look at the macro bursts of activity. So two minutes per hour or per 90 minutes, I literally look at my diary, look at my meetings, look at when I'm presenting, and I schedule this alarm goes off a lot during the day to get up and move and do squats or simply bounce on my trampoline. Ending this section, and then we'll open up for questions, Natalie, is around food. It's a huge topic. And all I'm saying to you is if it's in a factory, it's not real food. So look at what you can dig out the ground pluck off the trees, make uh, your own. We've got into a family ritual of making really uh, spoiling treats on the weekends. So we're eating gluten-free and sugar-free, but we're doing beautiful date balls and banana loaf and that kind of thing. And I'm not the baking mum. So I have to say it's a stretch for me to do these things. I follow a recipe and it's, I'm normally a hoy and make kind of mum. So it's, it's fun doing this as a family, you know, having real food available during the week for this kind of dash into the kitchen for five minutes and grab. And then I have non-negotiables around how I supplement. And I suppose because I do enjoy my sport, but that's the basic minimum. So please take a screenshot. I had a client 10 days ago who I kept on saying to people, take the screenshot and I can't tell you how many people have emailed back to say, what were those daily supplements again? That is your minimum. Magnesium is something that we often forget about. That's uh, useful for 340 different processes in your body. And if you're battling to sleep, you may be magnesium deficient. Okay, so we are rolling at 12.30. Uh, what do we have in the chat box, Natalie? Any questions on the body dimension of resilience? There's nothing on the chat box, but given there's so few of us, if anybody wants to jump in with a question, I think we can make time for that. So Willem's going to do my five, seven, nine, setting those boundaries, Willem. Good. Okay, if there's no chats, I'm going to steam on. And then why don't we invite you just to unmute 
and to ask questions as we go then. So I'm not going to, I'm going to wait, just speak over me. Let's make it messy and uh, easy and natural. So as a question pops to mind, just simply unmute and ask it. Okay, let's go on to emotions, a huge topic. I am an EQ practitioner and I love to enable people to learn these eight competencies of EQ. They're all learnable. Uh, many of us on this call know a lot about um, personality and the Enneagram, but I often say to people, that's great to know the personality that you were born, but if you don't understand the emotions that fuel that and how to be your best self, uh, you're missing a big trick. So the emotional topic is really huge and I've chosen just one thing to share with you. And practically, I use this one thing from this time last year, 365 days ago, I printed the Plutchik model out and I had that on our dining room table, I had that on our kitchen table and of course I have one on my desk. So if I had to say to you in the chat box, which I'm not going to do now, but just write down the words that you use to label your emotions. When I do this in groups, I promise you there are five words, seven words max that people use. So we get into this kind of discomfort zone of using the same words over and over. And hence uh, the fact that our emotional literacy is not really that good. So if we have a look at the brain and we start to understand what would happen if we put you and your brain into a functional MRI, is that the minute you start to name your emotions, this left ventricle part of your prefrontal cortex starts to simmer down. So we know the limbic system of the brain, and if you know the Dan Siegel's hand metaphor, is the big portion of the brain with the amygdala really in the center of that, that's the fight or flight, the center of emotion. All of this emotional part of the brain really is intricately integrated with your prefrontal cortex behind your forehead here. So your rational thinking, your executive function. So if you're not understanding your emotions and able to label them, that's when we get the amygdala hijack, when we flip our lid. So I have found in tense times, and it's tense and it's stressful, and in our family, and of course with my clients, is that this Plutchik wheel is incredibly practical and incredibly useful. So for those of you who don't know the model, the epicenter, obviously the intense emotions that first ring around the emotions are really the eight basic emotions that we um, talk about. Our joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, and anticipation. You can see there from the color intensity is the vignette, it gets lighter as those emotions get less intense. And then you have the combination emotions. So my 23 year old is, you know, looking at guys and starting to date and saying, mom, I recall that you got married to dad when you were 24. And I said, yes, oh my goodness, that's very young. I'd really um, be very surprised if she gets married that young and kids are not getting married that young. Um, she said, but how did you know you were in love? And I said, it was just this immense feeling of joy and this beautiful trust that we had. So Kritschik has so beautifully done this with combinations of emotions, joy and trust being love, anticipation and joy, looking at our optimism. And I really have a look at this and practically on our dining room table, when we're discussing the day's events or the planning or the who wants to go where for Easter and how that's gonna work and what about lockdown, et cetera, et cetera, is there's a lot of family discussion. And when I got married for the second time, Gavin said to me initially, Joni, don't you think we should have like a tennis ball on the table, dining room table, so that we each had a turn to talk? And I said, no, these volatile young ladies, they like to kind of get their opinion across about really strong-minded daughters. And uh, we talk over each other and everything's intense and it's got to be done now. And it's, it's really quite hilarious if you take a step back and watch it. But it's also important for us to discuss, are our emotions too intense for the actual situation? So certainly, you know, if they're in a state of rage about what a, one of their friends did, I go, are you really in a state of rage? Or are you just slightly annoyed that they didn't pitch to that particular dinner or, you know, you'd made them this special meal and it wasn't appreciated, whatever it is. 
And we start to be more specific about labeling the intensity of the emotion, but also putting words to it and really seeking to understand what that means for us. Knowing that, you know, there's always a washing machine of emotions. So there's not one predominant emotion normally, there's a combination of a whole lot. So we have found that the, the languaging around emotions, so that literacy around our dining room table has become far more effective with this project we all printed out, number one. And then the sharing of how do we choose to navigate those emotions. So with the resilience cycle, you would um, recollect visually that from awareness is to that self-belief, you know, how does that kind of behavior from someone else trigger my emotions? So in terms of, you know, my annoyance in that same example I've just given, and what does that say about me and my self-managing? What does it say about my needs, my interpersonal needs? And then how do I choose to navigate through those emotions? So we want to name them. We want to accept them. We want to welcome all of them in because all emotions are valid. It's like uh, all of your friends are welcome to come into your home. Every, every emotion has its place. So how do we not ignore some, push some down? We let them surface, name them, we tame them. And then how do we navigate through them? And then how do we notice our patterns around them? And certainly in looking at this project model, I have noticed my patterns around um, when I become pensive. What is triggering that sadness for me? How do I kind of I get into it? I, I observe it, I acknowledge it, and then how do I choose to get out of it? And what is it saying to me about a set of circumstances? So it really this project model may be, you know, kind of two-dimensional if you take it down to that beautiful cone at the top. It's got so much practicality in self-understanding and then interpersonally working with others. So I can do a whole hour just on this project model, but I would advise for you if you want to look at your emotional resilience, this would be a hell of a good starting point. So what is the difference between emotions, feelings and moods? you may want to ask yourself? Emotions are a chemical reaction. And the company that helped me develop the Resilience Up assessment that we've launched worldwide has done a lot of research, in fact, 25 years of research on emotions. And that chemical release we know when it's released into the brain is a six seconds, as in uh, S1X, no, SIX, not S1X, SIX, six seconds of that emotional release. Um, we then start to interpret these as feelings. And obviously when they become patterns and the feelings kind of entrench, they become moods. So I'm always very cognizant of what are my feelings telling me and how can I be self-compassionate? Uh, so if I link this project model to the body dimension, I know on the anniversary of my husband's death is I, I am really sad. I do relive the movie of that day. I do sink into it. And, and there are times where I think, gee, Joni, I've processed a lot and I've coped well and I acknowledge certain things, but I'm very self-compassionate on that day. And particularly if I just share September 2020, which was the, the 14th anniversary of his death, I recall getting out of bed thinking, ah, it's a cold, miserable, kind of gloomy, cloudy day. Um, I'm feeling a bit grim. I, I'm wondering whether a duvet day is in order. And actually I got up. Um, I did get dressed. I then just thought I didn't feel like sitting at my desk. I think I'll just rebound on my rebounder and listen to a really good podcast, which is what I did. And then I just sat at my desk and I thought, okay, I'm just going to journal. I'm just going to use the project model as a, um, a good trigger for what are these feelings, what's happening, and how can I just journal about them? So it's interesting. My go-to in my sad place is often motion. And one of my sayings to myself in terms of my own resilience is motion shifts emotion. So very often when I don't even know what I'm feeling, I might first go to the rebounder and bounce a little bit or my stationary bicycle and just not overthink it. So I'll go into body resilience, then come back to emotional resilience to unravel it and try and understand and make sense of it. So just look at how your natural patterns are and where you go 
you know, I suppose in my youth, if I'm going to be perfectly honest and vulnerable here, I used to go straight to the fridge to something starchy and sugary or a big slab of chocolate before I went into emotions. Um, and that was my hook. So I just thought I'd mention, you know, emotions, feelings and mood, because sometimes we mix those up and they are obviously mixed up, but it, emotion triggers a feeling and feelings over time and patterns become your moods. I love the Steve Jobs quote, never cut down a tree in the winter time, never make a negative decision in the low time, never make your most important decisions when you are in your worst moods. Wait, be patient. The storm will pass. The spring will come. This too shall pass. And I just think it's a good pause moment for really, you know, what are you feeling and how will this play out? And, you know, kind of what are the unintended consequences as well? Joan, Pat, so, yes, yep. I was going to say there's a question from Pat yes. in the chat room. Are you seeing it? I am. When you're triggered by an event or emotion, is it worthwhile using the clarifying process? Is it true? Is it false? Well, I don't know. First, before reacting, absolutely, Pat. Yeah, I would definitely use, and that's that very good clarifying process is what I call a brain interrupter. Because we, we know that reacting, um, you know, really doesn't get us anywhere. It's the good old Viktor Frankl. It's that space between so that we don't react and we do respond. So any clarifying process, um, I like yours. Is it true? Is it false? So I don't know. I will sometimes use a breathing um, technique as a, um, a clarifying process where I'm not thinking it through. I'm just being in my body. So for that, I'll use the Dr. McCola breathing process. So there's an event that triggers me emotionally, um, especially when I'm uh, like on a call and I'm strapped to my computer and I can't get into motion. And someone says something that's unfair about a colleague or, you know, giving negative feedback, you know, about another client and I get triggered. I will literally just sit up, you know, can see, you can see I've embodied it already, shoulders back, and I breathe in for the count of four. I hold my breath for seven counts. And then I breathe out audibly and loudly for eight. And obviously, you know, I'm on my on mute for that, and maybe I'm not pursing my lips quite as I've demonstrated here if I'm on a, um, everyone's got their cameras on, but I, uh, I really do love some clarifying process to just like give my brain that interrupter. I call it the windscreen wiper on your brain, Pat. So you're driving and it's drizzling and there are lots of mickeys and you want to wipe your brain clean to think, how do I want to choose to respond so that I'm not reactive? So thank you for that suggestion. Una, um, dialectical behavioral therapy for sure. Yeah, pleasure, Pat. So yeah, use, use, I have a couple of those different behavior interrupters um, for me that really, really work. Sometimes if I'm badly triggered in a meeting, I will fabricate a bathroom break. I've just got to get up. I've got to get out of the vicinity. I've got to go to the loo. And to be perfectly honest, there are times where after that loo, I do 50 squats frequently. Also just clearing the brain, clearing the brain, clearing the brain come back with my best self and I think, okay, how do I choose to respond or not respond? So I have a few little behavior interrupters in your toolkit. That's what I call, you know, having something ready and those little plasticine balls. So being prepared to be resilient. Uh, this emotional domain and dimension of resilience is a big one. We could spend a lot of time here. Okay, I'm going to move on. And uh, let's now speak about the mind dimension. So I've decided to put to Dr. Caroline Leaf's uh, book in here. It really is, uh, it's, I'm only, oh my goodness, like 50 pages in, but it's a terrific, terrific read so far. And uh, the mind dimension for me is so interesting. Um, and interesting, I mean, I don't know how many books she's written. I think it's about six or seven now. And 38 years of being in practice and working on the mind. And there are a lot of stats here that she's got in her book. But, you know, one of them that I recall from last night is that in the last few years in Australia, the use of antidepressants has gone up by 395%. And yet we still have this big depression problem. And whether it's Australia, South Africa, the States, Europe, it doesn't matter. 
but you know what are the things we can do to start to manage our mind what are the behaviors we can do to manage our mind and our mind is vastly different to our brain but uh, we've got to start to look at the patterns that we have of our thinking what can you do differently this think feel act is really the point that i'm going to share with you here in this dimension so single-mindedly is uh, this is what i do is i i use and i've actually got a fantastic exercise that i do um i don't know if i've still got it on my desk here um it's a set of cards that six seconds have developed called the think feel act cards i do have it on my desk here and um I often play this either online or with clients in face to face is just look at the circumstance that you're in so think about it how did you feel at the time what were you thinking at the time what action did you take that's my reminder not to go out of time with you guys and then you know turn the the you know perspective around what was the other person thinking feeling do you think and how did they act and then how would you choose for it to be different? So I either play it quite practically with a set of cards. Um, we do it with an online version where you can pick cards um, or I do it on my own. And sometimes as a behavior interrupter, Pat, pretty much like the emotions we've just spoken about, is I will get up from my desk. Um, I've luckily got a little cottage in the garden. I walk across a, a stretch of grass to the house. And I, all I do is as I breathe in, I go, okay, Joni, what am I thinking and feeling <sighs> without what do I choose? And very often, I'm going to be honest, there's not like a miraculous, you know, mental solution that comes to mind. And I can use it for tiny things that are pretty insignificant to big dilemmas, business model dilemmas, um, collaboration with different company dilemmas, or just, um, gee, it's lunchtime. I'm going to go and have something to eat. Uh, what is going to be, you know, how am I going to prioritize the afternoon? I've, I don't have to present. I've got a whole lot of stuff admin to do. You know, what do I think, what do I feel, what am I going to choose to do first? So I use it really in small ways and bigger ways. But this as a mental clearing and a tapping into the whole ecosystem is a fantastic technique. I really love it. The second mental technique I do is... Um, very often in my morning meditation is and please try this it's just such a lovely sensation and I do it during the day sometimes I just close my eyes and I just go okay I'm feeling mentally like a little bit brain fogged and fatigued from the morning um let me visualize putting a smile in my brain and I actually feel like this little mini lift off on the side of my temples here when I visualize a smile in my brain and I, I just can't help but feeling a little lighter mentally cognitively every time I put a smile in my brain so they're so micro they're so tiny but as I say these are the very practical things that I do during the day there's a lot of uh, obviously Martin Seligan's work that I do on you know is it permanent is it temporary is it pervasive is it isolated etc so I love his work and that all of those techniques are the power of stepping away how do I choose to step away and get perspective from a mental um dimension of resilience and then I love the uh, instead of the polarity thinking this or that I love the and you know can you be strong and vulnerable what's the and in the discussion and I often ask myself even if I'm self-coaching Joni what's the and in this versus it's either that or it's that or that's not right or that could be this way or you know I promised that and it couldn't be that you know, it's uh, really, it doesn't have to be that polarity thinking. So what is the and in your self-language, this dialogue? I love Na Na uh, Martina Navratilova. The game of life is played in the six inches between your ears. So, you know, what are you self-coaching on and what's your internal dialogue saying about your mental resilience? Okay, and we're going on to purpose now, um, which is a huge, huge topic. I was uh, in my master's with uh, six seconds for EQ, taught a fantastic purpose technique and um, a technique of coming up with what is your purpose on, on the planet, which I'm going to share mine with you. But I also like to take purpose from this big purpose on the planet, kind of what's my North Star, to what's my daily purpose. And I do do a daily reset. So at the start of each day, I have my, I wake up, um, about 20 minutes earlier than the family. I have my steaming cup of hot coffee. I sit in the lounge in the same spot. I watch the sun rise if it's that time of the year or sometimes it's, it's not. 
Um, but I kind of go, what do I want this day to bring? Um, and my purpose on the planet, so that, that story I told you about September last year, waking up on the anniversary of my husband's death, on that rebound, it was quite interesting because I've been working on this purpose statement for about two years. And um, it just rolled off my tongue without me having to think it through. So I think when it becomes part of your mitochondria, your purpose on the planet, it just it serves to enable you. And mine is to inspire actionable resilience for people to live their best and most optimal life. So whenever I'm putting a program together, I think really, you know, what's the so what now what in it? What is the practical actionable part of it? And um, that's the bigger purpose on the planet. But then what are my micro purposes for the day? You know, what I hope the day is going to bring. And I do that also, uh, not only in my morning steaming hot cup of coffee and my meditation and prayer time, but I also make sure that I do that uh, when I'm brushing my teeth. So my morning brushing my teeth, I think about, hey, you know, what is this day going to bring? And, you know, what, how am I going to squeeze the juice out of the day is my, my saying I like to use. And then I loop that back at the end of the day and I think okay I had those thoughts this morning you know it's beyond what's in the diary it's kind of what I want this day to bring out of it you know sometimes it's a fun thing and then at the end of the day I think okay how was that you know and maybe it wasn't so good or maybe I dropped the ball there like really badly um but it's it's looping back to kind of the what I call the book ending of the day how I start my day and how I end my day those are also my non-negotiables. I really do take control on the book ending of, of my day. And uh, that's triggered by the, my brushing the teeth. At the end of my day, I also do have a beautiful Epsom salts bath and I read my book in the bath. And that's also a great book end. And it's, it's kind of like, how did this day work for me in terms of why I believe I'm, I'm on this planet and what I want to give to the planet and share with the planet and share with my significant others. So purpose is a big discussion. Um, here it has been absolutely microwaved. But really, what is your purpose today, next week, next quarter? What do you want to um, life to show? You know, how do you want to show up in life yourself? And what do you want life to bring for you? Okie dokie. So uh, it is time for action. Um, this lady looks like a the action lady for me. And um, if there are no questions and nothing's popped up in the chat box, of course, you can email me. And then we are going to invite you as a call to action to email Natalie. So Natalie, if you, uh, if you email Natalie, let me put it this way around, your tiny habits. So if you can think through anything from body, emotions, mind, or purpose that you want to start to do differently, or you may have triggered a thought, hey, I used to do that. Joni didn't speak about that, but maybe I'll just bring back that tiny habit into my life that I've kind of just let slip. So we would love to receive your emails on that. And then in return, as I said at the start, nothing for nothing, we'll email you a resilience poster. And then out of those emails, we will select five lucky winners to run a resilience coaching session with me. And uh, we'll look at the EQ underbelly and then we'll look at uh, really how you are choosing to manage your own resilience cycle in terms of awareness, self-belief, your own impact in terms of your own inner control and applying consequential thinking. And then of course, uh, the patterns in your life. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to look at that. It says two minutes to go. I'm going to just uh, leave it over to Anita to wind us up wind us up like a spinning top no that's not what I was planning to say I'm going to leave it over to Anita to close the session not wind us up <laughs> thank you Joni wow it, it really is packed full there and the piece on purpose really spoke this week into the theme of the master leader program as well where we were very much focusing in on purpose because there is this great calling on the planet right now around individual purpose, the collective purpose, you know, one can really go from that minuscule right into the, the meta. And we'd really love to hear from those of you who are on the call today. I know we're short of time now, but if you would like to stay on a couple of minutes to ask any questions informally, please do so, as well as write into us and share your feedback. 
share if we met your needs on the call today, what you might like to know more of, even if it's a sound bite of something, because we're building into the, the September lead up to the inaugural program and your, your voices really matter to us as we shape and craft this journey because this journey is for each of us and it's for all of you. And thank you, Joni, for leading the way with your incredible energy, uh, your gift to the world, sharing it with us so graciously. We've got so much to learn and looking forward to the journey ahead. So thank you, everyone. I just want to say thank you very much. Oh, I just want to say thank you very much. It was really insightful. Nice to see both of you ladies again, working together, doing amazing things. But it was just a, a nice way to reflect and, and ask yourself, am I performing well in all of these areas? And I'm going to be busy this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Have a lovely day. I have to go and parent. Please excuse me. Enjoy, William. Thank you for attending. Thanks for your support. Hi, Johnny. This is Will here. Hi, Will. Hi. I work a lot with uh, teenagers. That's my passion. Hmm. And um, since they're always disconnected from the parents, you're unfair. You don't care about me. Always mourning around. And I think this would really be grounding to them to begin to get to build the resistance in terms of growing and understanding that the way parents look at children and children look at parents, it's like going the opposite direction. And yet they all got the same interests. But with this to say, take a break, breathe, stop, you know, mm. make a choice, but mm. based on the things that you learn. So I think somehow it's to, I'm just looking at it. So in applying this to the, to that environment between teenager and parent, a kind of challenging situation that's always existing in every family, mm. you know, sort of have a, a, a parent child session with a teenager and play that out. That would really be give a much impact specifically now that we need to build a lot of resilience in parents and both in children so exactly. that nobody feels, you know, handicapped with exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you make such a good point. We um, have been approached, um, by uh, University of Berkeley for our resilience assessment for schools and really for the social emotional learning curriculum. And um, we've got a guy there who heads up a number of schools and he's going to be using Berkeley psychologist students to administer our resilience assessment with social uh, in schools. So the teenagers that you with, I mean, you're gonna make a big, big difference. Um, that I think if we start to teach them basic emotional intelligence, basic coping skills, basic self-managing skills, and then the communication between, as you so rightly said, the parents and them, and you know, what are the ways of kind of managing that very natural tension that there is? So, yeah, I, I, I fully concur with you that we need to, it would not be need to, we, I mean, we're starting to do this uh, at a high school level. Thank you. Ron, you Johnny? are off mute. Yes. Hi. Hi, I'm off mute. <laughs> Hi there. Nice to see you. Yes, you um, too. Just a question. In fact, um, I was laughing when you were talking about seven hours sleep because that's anathema. You know, I sort of manage two hours sometimes and it's crazy. And uh, yes, there are burnout effects. And I'm also going through a period of grief, which mm. is um, very, very difficult. It's only been a year. And uh, I just find that with the pandemic and all that, there's a degree of apathy and demotivation and a sense of isolation. Mm. And I'm just here, I'm mm. not moaning or anything else. The mm. good thing about it is that I've um, just through my own practice, I practice Zen for many, many years. So mm. I've developed a certain level of awareness of what's going on in terms of my misconceptions and the neural pathways and all the mm. things you were talking about. Here's my question. Um, I think I sent this at about three in the morning to you, Anita. It was a little saying I came across by Pema Chodron, whom we all know, maybe, maybe we don't. And uh, it just resonated with me and it says, only to the extent that we expose ourselves over and over to annihilation, can that which is indestructible be found in us. And um, 
I don't interpret annihilation as going out of there and throwing myself into Daniel's uh, lion's den, but dropping all the sense and need to accomplish, to be better, to survive in this world, to be sunny, to be happy, and to have a path, as you've described, and it's not a criticism in any way, but more a sense of complete surrender, moment to moment, just being there, opening myself up fully to the pain of annihilation, and somehow finding that resilience to pick up the computer that I've just thrown against the wall, or whatever it happens to be, that's proverbial, mm. or figurative rather, mm. <laughs> rather than literal. But mm. it's a different way of approaching it. It's a way of um, learning how to live in this world almost as an observer, as you were saying, but without detachment. I don't know if that makes any sense at all to you. It does. I mean, that's really the basis of mindfulness, isn't it? So it's kind of, mm. what is it right now? Um, yeah. And I, I breathe into that. What is it right now? Good. It's not easy. It's, it's absolutely not easy. Oh. And it's, um, and there's no recipe actually, isn't there? So it's, um, it's taking the uniqueness of your situation and breathing into it right now. And as you say, not trying to strive, drive, achieve, or it's kind of like the breathing into what is it right now. And, you know, the, the big, I mean, the big area of discussion there is the self-compassion. It is kind of, you know, for you, if we just take the grief dimension and the aloneness, you know, it's a year and it's like, what is it? What is the self-compassion for Ron right now? Um, and that's different day to day. Maybe you've got a new client. Yeah, not until you start sleeping minimum six and a half hours a night. I would never take you on. So I, uh, <laughs> I'm being serious. It's, it's that sleep is that that instrumental on how we self-manage emotions, how we self-reflect, how we honor thyself, you know, um, how we know thyself. I mean, Socrates said knowing thyself was the beginning of wisdom, but if you, if you not, I mean, the, the body is designed, this is not sleeping. This is clearing away toxic waste at night. It is very, mm. very busy. And if you're not enabling the ecosystem to repair, restore, hardwire, wash out at night, then your day work is a waste of time. It's, so the circadian, honor yeah. thy circadian rhythm. It's, it's, it's a, I mean, it should be tattooed across your arm. Honor thy circadian rhythm. It's how we are designed. You know, I, I try even in this modern world to say, on a mass circadian rhythm run, and it's not its not seven days a week. If I get it right, three or four days a week, like I've had a good week, but I try and watch the sunrise and I try and watch the sunset and I get that sunlight into my eyes. Yeah, well, um, I'm not going to bore everybody else. You know, it's not a matter of not wanting to, it's a matter of not being able to mm. sleep, you know, and uh, yeah, you yeah. develop patterns as well and... Exactly. It's not that I'm lying over there thinking and um, meandering in my mind. It's just that I find it difficult. And even yeah, the sleeping yeah. pills don't work properly. But no, I'll, beat, you know, I'll, I'll do something. I was just about to say I'll beat myself up. But that would have been... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's the thing. It's, you know, the cognitive behavior therapy behind that is interesting around how we rewire some of those patterns um, because that's what it is. It's rewiring some of those patterns um, yeah. so that you provide the right enablers for sleep because there, there will be periods of time in your life where you can't sleep and when I say to people you know I, I literally used to pick up still knots the box of sleeping tablets and kiss them every night and go those new product development people who ever designed you thank the Pope they designed you because these are the yummiest things ever so you know I'm not against sleeping tablets um you know for certain periods of life or, or issues that we have to deal with but then we've got to look at how from a cognitive behavior therapy perspective, how we can learn new management techniques that work for us as an individual. And again, no cookie cutter, but it's uh, we can reprogram and repattern. It takes effort. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Ron, for sharing and yeah, sending much love. Are you still in the Cape? 
I am. You know, um, there's an old expression that says, where do you find a frog with no legs? And the answer is where you left it. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> it's funny, but it's really horrible. <laughs> Anita, I'm going to leave you to close off. I am going to have to go now by yeah. quarter part. Yeah, we're over time. Thank you, though. That was interesting dialogue, deep. And thanks for holding the space, Joni. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. See you around the next corner. Be well, stay well, and resilient up.